Okay, I'd like to welcome everyone to China's Urban Revolution, Understanding Chinese Eco-Cities. Uh, I've got a very experienced panel today. Sitting over here is Austin Williams, the author of a forthcoming book entitled China's Urban Revolution, Understanding Chinese Eco-Cities. And he'll be talking about this topic with slides about, around about seven, eight, nine minutes. And then I'll be inviting our distinguished panelists to respond. Without further ado, I'll introduce Austin. So this is just a very quick whiz through China's urbanization. And it's almost by definition, it's going to miss as much as it touches upon. Uh, I will pretend that that means it, it's lots of gaps that you can fill in with questions and comments and observations. And I think that it's not so much to have a go at me in your comeback, but if you want to make your own contributions as well, please feel free. So look, I'm just going to spin through a couple of things on China, some of the data, some of the uh, quality and, qu and quantity issues, uh, and the ambitions behind the, 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 the uh, urbanization drive over the last 25, 30 odd years. Um, and then take a look at the new thing which we've, looked, we've called in the title Eco Cities, but in general, it's kind of looking at the quality of, uh, of urban environments. So this is the kind of thing that people imagine when they see China. The, the original picture, this one, is 1985, and this is 2015. So that kind of 30-year period has transformed a flat, some people say, unoccupied uh, uh, farmland area into one of the great photograph selfie pictures of all times. The building on the right hand side there is the Shanghai Tower. It's just been completed this year, the second tallest building in the world now. So it's kind of one of those things where you now see China, uh, sometimes people imagine it to be still rickshaws and shanties, which in, in truth many parts are, and then you have this kind of incredible explosion of, of urbanism uh, and development. And I think it's worthwhile, first of all, just making the statement that most Chinese statistics are bullshit. So we have to take things with a pinch of salt, yes? So if you just take a look at the rapid urbanization, and, and there is rapid urbanization, but just to be clear, from the foundation of the People's Republic of 120 cities to 176, a big growth in cities, by the 1960s, with the so-called Great Leap Forward, we have a disappearance of 40 cities. So we go back beyond 1957. There's this idea that actually you wanted industrialization without urbanization. That was one of Mao's great demands. So there's a, a loss of urbanization. Many, many people being reclassified from urban residents to agricultural. Many people moving away from urban cities uh, into, the, into the countryside. Then you see this kind of spark take over after the opening up in 1978, 1982 is 182 cities. The reason I still say statistically it's dubious is because they reclassified what it meant to be a city, what it meant to be urban in 1980. So e even these data is, is slightly dubious, but you can still see there's an explosion in urban development that has gone on. In 1950, 11 percent, 1980, 14 percent, although that is a very contested figure, and 2016, 50 2%. So there has been a remarkable, the greatest urban transformation of humanity in history. Uh, and it's kind of worthwhile trying to ex explore why that is and what that is. As you can see, it's mainly happened on the right-hand side, the east side of the, of the uh, country. But now they're starting to move, as part of the Go West campaign, they're starting to develop many, many cities within the, within the inner areas and on the kind of Kazakhstan uh, border. So this is a picture of the famous Ordos ghost town, which I, I, I recommend you read Wade Shepard's book called Ghost Cities of China, uh, which kind of debunks the idea that actually these are ghost cities at all. In the West, the development of a city has been, or in the world, the development of the city has tended to be organic. So you have a small settlement, it grows, it develops, and you know, people move in. What happens in China is that if you build a new infrastructure, there's nobody there. So you have to build a city. This has never happened before. And the city, by definition, is empty. And then you either cattle prod 
people into the city or they come in or it becomes part of a developmental process. But the fact that cities are being built and are photographed empty doesn't mean they're ghost cities. It means that they are cities yet to grow. If you go to places like Baltimore in America or you go to kind of dying Rust Belt, Rust, Rust Belt in America, they are ghost cities. And you see this, again, statistical thing. So there was a data back in 2005 which said that China is, is uh, building 20 cities a year every year for 20 years. 20 cities a year every year for 20 years. Now, what that means is actually they're building 27 new cities, really. But then they're upgrading, they're expanding, they're developing, they're moving the city up in, its, in city status. Now, that still means that they are growing they are building, they are creating uh, huge areas. The city I'm in at the moment, Suzhou, is an old town, and then they've built an equivalent new town of three and a half million people. It's a kind of city that nobody's ever heard of, but it's not, it's not building necessarily a new city. It's an expansion, it's a development of the existing framework. So take the data with a pinch of salt, but still recognize that something remarkable is happening in China. Uh, if I move on to urbanization, the second point really is the kind of idea of the Kuznets curve idea that, you know, you reach a certain point in development, just as did the Victorians. At a certain point, they thought maybe for a developed uh, country, sending children up chimneys isn't the best symbol of our civilized status in the world. In China, they also have reached a certain status where they recognize that actually uh, maybe something of quality needs to be now implemented rather than just quantity. So the idea of building lots of cities but lots of crap cities is not necessarily the best thing to do. So now bringing some quality in. This is a picture from 1964, it's a terrible colorized image of Shenzhen, 1964. This is an even worse picture of Shenzhen now. I mean, 64, it could have been 74, yes? So from nothing to this, from 30,000 people lived in, in Shenzhen in 1985. 30,000 people, and now it's 15 million. Now, obviously, there's, there are questions to be asked here, right, as to how could that happen. I don't think it could happen anywhere else in the world that they would be allowed for that to happen uh, because it meant people's houses, their livelihoods, their communities, their areas, their memories being demolished and a new city being built. That's partly due to the fact that there is a dynamism to China where people want a little bit more of the action. There's a growth. So people want a little bit more financial stability. And also there's a pliant population uh, who are readily accepting of many of these things. And of course the final uh, part of the equation is a reasonably authoritarian regime that actually gets these things, these things done. But in terms of the smog, this is a picture from London in 1952 in the Great Smog where 12,000 people died, famously 12,000 people died in two weeks in London. The conditions in China haven't really got to that stage yet. This is Beijing now. And it's a pollution problem which is eminently solvable, and many people now recognize that it is a problem. Part of the idea within China is to say that we've reached a certain stage of development, we have many cities, we have urban residents, uh, we have a dynamic economy. Now we have to deal with these issues. And an emerging middle class within China is obviously protesting about these kind of qualities of urban life. Some people moving out of cities. Uh, and the growth of the eco-city movement is one of those phenomena where to develop a, a new area, a new uh, city in some ways where people can move, which not only has the accommodation and the industry and the, uh, and the parkland, but it also has quality environments. Uh, of where you can take your children. It's almost the, it's the urban equivalent of the suburban story that happened in Britain in the 1960s. Uh, so uh, again, in terms of Kuznets curves, you can see that actually uh, as, the GDP, as the GDP increases, so you have factors of uh, uh, sulfur dioxide being removed. Obviously the carbon emissions are still going up in China, uh, but they, they are planning on taking action. So in terms of the idea of uh, China wanting to now to create cities which are not seen to be the polluting, uh, harmful uh, areas uh, that they've been pilloried for for a long time, if you want to be a major player on the world stage, if you want to be a global leader and invite the G20 to your, uh, to your uh, country, then Hangzhou. So Hangzhou it was, the, was the city where the G20 was held. Hangzhou is now the latest eco-city. 
This is just a little map showing the new development of eco-cities. So 2007, there were seven eco-cities, 2011, 15, and 2011 is when I started having ideas to write my book. And I thought, seven eco-cities is kind of fine by me. I can handle that. Uh, and just uh, last year, they announced there are 284 eco-cities in China. Um, uh, it's, uh, what is that? One third of all cities in China are now eco-cities. Now, as we started with the statistics, that is obviously bullshit, yes? So, but there is something about this conversation which has a truth to it, in terms of what it is that China wants to represent. This is just flagging up some of the main stories. This list here on the, on the left are the top 10 eco-cities in China. I think it'd be hard pushed to recognize more than three or four of them on the list. Yes, these are third tier cities that are now beginning to invest a little bit more in not just air quality, but in wastewater management, in terms of refuse collection, in terms of uh, you know, the sponge city idea, which is to absorb water so it doesn't run off. These are just mainstream ideas of improving the quality of the urban space. Uh, and it's an interesting thing because the West doesn't really know this and it doesn't really want to know it in some ways. You know, China is the biggest manufacturer of, of wind power. China is the biggest manufacturer of uh, photovoltaics. It has the Three Gorges Dam, obviously. And it's, it's one of the leading authorities in what we might call environmental uh, energy uh, generation. But that has now been kind of pilloried as uh, China undermining the Western solar panel market in Germany. Uh, and so Ch whatever China tries to do, the goalpost seems to be moved. But they are trying to improve. This is a little map showing Lake Nasa and the Aswan Dam in Egypt and the Three Gorges Dam on the right-hand side. So just to kind of get a comparison of the dams, but actually the Three Gorges Dam, that's 10 times the size of reality. That's actually, that's the same scale of the Aswan Dam to the Three Gorges Dam. Uh, but the Three Gorges Dam produces 10 times the amount of electricity. So the, the technology, the power, the efficiency of these productions has really kind of moved on. Right, just very quickly, I'm just going to quickly scan through some of these ideas of eco-cities. This is Dongtan in Chongming. This is the failed Arab project for Dongtan. If you look at Arab's website, it's still on there. These are other examples, and they're all kind of made up. So even though statistically China should be challenged in the way that it presents itself, actually it works the other way around as well, because there are so many architects. This is Dillis Scofidio, American architects, just won the competition. They're, kind of, they're never going to be built. Yeah, this is kind of the West playing around in China because they think they can, making up anything. This guy is a lunatic. Vincent <laughs> Calibo, all he does is draw these stupid drawings. Yes? And he wants vertical farms. Yes? I mean, this is the environmental idea of cycling, walking, communal farms. This is a picture from 1973 from Chung Kuo, the movie that was banned in China for 30 years. And it, here we go again. There's, I'll wait for Calibo. There he is. Palo Haimo, an invention in Beijing. So there's a lot of... There's Calibo again. This is all he does. He doesn't have any work. He just does these drawings. And, and this is the reality. So you have, you have failed eco-cities, you have fictitious eco-cities, and then you have the real kind of ones, which is this new build in Tianjin. But the main point I wanted to try and say to you, I suppose, is that actually the concept of eco-cities is just the way that China is really coming to exercise its soft power to rebrand itself. They're trying to build decent cities, and they're now recognizing that if you want to be on the world stage, the eco brand is the really way forward to try and kind of dominate the discussion and to kind of put two fingers up to the West. So if you actually were to compare Tianjin, eco city with London, you will find that on every level, London actually beats an eco city. On every measure, it beats a defined eco city. You may want to brand London as the new British eco city if that's the way you've so felt. I think it kind of represents a lot of myth making. But in some ways, it also, underlying that, is a truth that China is really trying to develop a decent uh, metropolitan infrastructure for the next generation. Thank you very much. I'd now like to welcome Dr. Ying Ying Chang, who is a master planner, urban designer, and researcher, director of the China Design Center. I 
Um, I work for China Design Center, which is like a knowledge exchange organization that um, every year we bring a lot of planners and urban designers and architects to come to the UK to learn. So we also organize conferences or forums for the China part. And I just come back from London last night. We organized a conference in, in Hangzhou, um, the city that Austin mentioned. Um, this is, this is to understand um, how, um, because Austin has given a big picture of how China has changed in the past 30 years and the rapid urbanization, um, which the next stage of urbanization that the government is focusing on a lot on the small towns and the cities, that gives a lot of opportunity to, you know, to, to, um, achieve the quality of place and the quality of the cities in the next stage. Um, and the failure of the eco city, you know, in the past uh, few years, and also the, the, chi the China has also learned a lot of lessons. And I want to make the three points from our recent experience um, working with uh, the China's developers and the government. The first is the eco town. You know, this, this as Austin said, it could be a brand of a build a better quality um, of life and, and, and the quality, uh, high quality cities. What actually China is aiming to achieve is the happiness and the quality life in the places. And this was related to not only building homes, but also a lot of service facilities, retail, leisure, and health and education, and also efficient public transport and open spaces. They know that, and, and they try to integrate it into the whole concept of happiness and the living in harmony with nature and the dealing with um, the relations between human and the human and the human and nature. So um, a lot of themes has been a lot of concept has been raised um, in, in the conferences that we organize in Hangzhou. And I think um, they would like to also like to build a lifetime community, you know, equivalent to our lifetime home here, that meets um, people's needs from the cradle uh, to the elderly years. And the second point I want to make is how to achieve that. You got the goal of the happiness um, and the quality of life, and the health and the well-being, uh, living in the towns and the cities, but how to achieve that. So China is always criticized by its top-down approach, because um, a lot of, a lot of um, projects uh, led by the government, like uh, the Dongtai Eco Town, got the, um, is failed. Um, but um, we are trying to help the China side to learn um, the, the collaborative process that Western is using here and build uh, and first you have to need the strong leadership and the shared vision for the future and then w which which will be beneficial to all the stakeholders um, because e um, when all the stakeholders know uh, this this will uh, give the benefit to everybody then the vision will be built and um, all the eco, so, uh, the social economic infrastructure as well, be embedded from the beginning um, at the uh, building of the towns and the cities. It's like the ghost towns that um, Austin mentioned, because it's all second homes. It's like investment assets, and there is no social and economic life there. This is why it's, co it's caused uh, all the ghost towns there. And the third point I want to mention is. Um, because we work with uh, a prestigious um, Chinese developer who is it, would like to achieve the, the best quality of the towns. And they would like to set up a system um, which, is, uh, which is for the community's long-term stewardship. Uh, this is, this is a quite um, um, a new in China because in the UK we have the garden cities and we um, we try to build these kind of community organizations to have the self-governance. And in China, these things um, are happening and they try to, to learn from the Western systems, but also um, combine with the Chinese systems that to explore a right model for the long-term stewardship. Um, this could be like uh, community, community trust um, could it be like um, the foundation and um, 
this will ensure that there is a long-term benefit to the community and also and the community can organize itself to achieve a, a long-term a vibrant and a livable um, livable towns and the cities and and they they are they are very keen to make clear about um, what the government do for the town and what the community organization could do for the town and in in the longer term how the government policies uh, will influence um, the, the, the town's long-term management because in China land is leased by 70 years or 50 years this gives a lot of uncertainties to the developers and the community um, for the long-term uh, development or long-term stewardship. Um, I think these these sorts these three points are sort of made is from the the um, is is sort of from the bottom-up approach to understand how the developers and community would like to achieve and how that are going to go with the government policies um, to realize a more kind of sustainable and a livable Ch Chinese towns. Thank you. Mm. <laughs> now I'd like to welcome Dr. Carrie Brown, who's the director of the Lao China Institute at King's College London. Great, thank you very much. So, I, I, look, I'm not an expert in urban um, planning, um, so my mind is wholly uncontaminated with knowledge, uh, which seems to be rather popular these days. So uh, I um, will say four things. One about political narratives, so sort of tying into your idea of narratives. Second about community, which you mentioned. And the third um, about deep China, the place called deep China. And the fourth, really a couple of questions, actually. Um, so the first is uh, political narratives. You know, um, these cities, I think, are uh, representative of a kind of very distinctive political narrative. Li Keqiang, the premier, talked, I think, of the idea of creating a new economic model where you have higher service sector, higher urbanization, um, higher consumption. And so cities are sort of pretty central political tools. And I think in the last census in 2010, it was 50% of Chinese people living in cities. Uh, and now uh, I think the aspiration is quite soon to have 70% living in cities. Although when you look at cities and rural areas in China, you can barely tell the difference sometimes. Um, and so, you know, that kind of political narrative uh, that these cities are kind of physical embodiments of is a highly state-directed one. I, I mean, the hand of the state is always there. You showed that great image of Pudong uh, and uh, Yashong Huang in a wonderful book about, you know, what's wrong with Shanghai said, you know, that kind of uh, new development built from the 1980s was built on illegality because the land was stolen from most of the farmers who had that land and it was really state-directed. 85% of it was state-directed. So the role of the state is still pretty profound. And that leads to um, the, the, the sort of second issue about community. You mentioned community. So in Shanghai, uh, in an area of 640 square kilometers, so it currently has a population of 24 million, and that increases by half a million every year. And you kind of think about how on earth do you create cohesive or meaningful communities in places where everyone is an outsider. So I think the current population of Shanghai, maybe seven million are Shanghainese, but I mean, everyone's from somewhere else, Shenzhen, I mean, everyone's from somewhere else. So how do you kind of create cohesive communities uh, and kind of meaningful communities when you have uh, it's just so much newness? Uh, I mean, that seems profoundly difficult. And sort of people who participate in their communities in such a way that they feel that the built landscape is something that they're contributing to rather than something that is imposed upon them. Um, the third thing is about the place called Deep China. So we all know, as you say, the statistics about the place that is called, you know, the China of statistics, and we deal with that all the time. But there's been a lot of work over the last few years on this sort of place called Deep China, the China of aspirations, people's changing kind of psyche, basically. Um, I was at a meeting uh, about three years ago with a Politburo member, Liu Yunshan, who's the sort of head of the ideology. And he said something about over the last 30 years in China, um, you've got changes which are material, and you can see them in the kind of built landscape. But you have, you know, and every day there's been change. Every day there's been change. I went back to Huahart in, in Mongolia uh, in 2010, where I'd lived in the early 90s and the mid 1990s, and I couldn't recognize anything. Everything has changed. But he made this point about, you know, we can kind of deal with the changes that are physically manifested, 
but we don't know how to deal with the party, Communist Party, with the changes in people's hearts. And, you know, Xi Jinping uses a much more emotional register in his sort of political messaging now. But I kind of wonder whether, you know, these cities are highly, they're, they're symbols predominantly of aspiration. Uh, but, but, you know, in what ways are, are those sort of aspirations dictated again by political fiat rather than by kind of an organic growth within people? Um, they seem awfully Maoist in a way. The shadow of Mao never quite goes away. Very finally, um, you mentioned Dongtang. I mean, why didn't that work? I mean, I remember in 2008, I think mean, the people here, you know, that amount of propaganda that was produced over that. Uh, and um, I mean, the fact that it's still on the website is quite interesting. So why didn't it work with all that sort of political will? Um, and finally, um, so in the Maoist period, the future was sort of 100 years in the, in, in, you know, in, in the distance. In Deng Xiaoping's era from 1980, it was sort of, decades in the future. Uh, and now the, the future is now. The future is within the next five years, the centennial goal. So what is your prediction for what these cities are going to look like in 10 years' time? Because having struggled around some parts of Shenzhen you know, in the last sort of month or so, I mean, this newness is getting awfully tacky really quickly. So I just wonder, will the future look as good as we were always expecting it to be? Thank you. Our final respondent is Dr. Wei Yang, who is the Royal Chartered Town Planner and the founding director of Wei Yang and Partners. Thank you, Grant. Hi, it's a pleasure to come to speak here today. Actually, I'm a planner. I've been uh, living in the UK for 70 years, and I uh, founded Wei Yang and Partners five years ago in London. And my aim is to really promote best practice in planning worldwide. Um, it's quite interesting, actually, Austin raised the question about eco-cities. When I read the eco-city, I think, wow, it's a term I haven't heard for a while. Because, actually, I'm not sure if you're aware, uh, eco-towns program was started in the UK. UK was the first country uh, really uh, had this name mentioned. It was from 2007. That was a labor government uh, program. And in uh, China, actually, uh, Chinese Ministry of Housing and Urban Rural Development, they adopted the uh, eco-city idea in China. And actually, to be honest, as a planner, and I really don't think, actually, eco-city is a special type of uh, city. Because actually, if you think about nowadays with the more advanced technology and all the availability of smart technology and everything else, actually, eco-city should be the same as smart cities, as our garden cities. Really, it's a place can offer people uh, a livable place for people to live, work, and play. And uh, you can have a close association with the natural environment, and you can have a local job. And also, the home should be, should be affordable. So I think, actually, it should be ideal uh, planning methodology for the planners and for the local authorities and for the politicians and also for the communities to enjoy. I really don't think it's a special type of development. Uh, and also, actually, um, when Austin showed the pictures of different types of, uh, uh, of eco-cities, or if from my concept, they are just cities in China, uh, we have to know, actually, city planning is a process rather than a product. Because we, the city changes, evolves every day. The best city should be somewhere like London should be able for generations to adapt their life to live and work and play. So we really cannot see a snapshot of today's image to say actually this is the, the fate of this city. So it's a, a moving process. And uh, I want to give a good example actually is in, uh, in the UK. A um, lot of people heard about Milton Kings. Actually Milton Kings, uh, next year Milton King is Milton Kings 50th anniversary. I think actually it's one of the most successful cities in the world being created by planners and by a government. Because 50 years ago, uh, the government decided to dedicate a new town, a new town really inspired by the garden city ideas. That was the one of the largest new towns built in the UK. It was designated for a population of 250,000 people. Because of that, actually, the city is striving, has offered a huge job opportunities and also very affordable housing in a relatively expensive area of England, the southeast England. So actually I think there are a lot we can learn from that. And also we talk about garden cities, smart cities. Why cannot we 
combine all the best elements and make sure actually the planning professions can join everything together and work with other professions to build the ideal towns or cities, wherever it is, either in China or in the UK. I want to say actually, uh, in 2007, although UK mentioned or started the eco city, eco town program, but actually no one was built. It's a great shame if we could use this knowledge to build something really can provide affordable housing for the local public, uh, local community. What would be a, a great, what would not be a great idea? But uh, because I think political change and everything, actually nothing really happened. And now we have Garden City program, but it's still again quite slow. So I think really we need to give uh, professionals enough. Uh, credibility for them to do something they really want to do and be able to do it in a good standard. And also, because just a very final point, um, we, I think lots of media coverage about China talking actually China is already one of the richest country. But actually, you need to think about it in another way. I just got a number from the uh, United Nations uh, figure. Actually, if you think about the GDP per capita, China is only on the 113 rank worldwide. So actually it's among one of the poorest countries in the world. UK is about 29th place. So if you think about that, actually China is a vast country. There was still a lot to do. So city planning is a process. I think China is still on the way to make it better. Thank you. Okay, if I could see the hands of anyone who'd like to speak. So um, a few times the, you know, shadow of Mao came up and uh, reasonable authoritarianism came up. And so, you know, China is, of course, different in terms of its political history than the United Kingdom and, you know, has more pressing environmental conditions. But in, in terms of actually facilitating those types of change in the UK and in, you know, the, the quote-unquote Western world more generally, does the panel think that some type of strong hand is necessary to get that kind of, you know, on the tracks? Thank you very much. My question perhaps follows on from the previous gentleman's. How is planning taking account of the ending of the one child policy and addressing um, what I suspect is probably a social issue causing a lot of concern in China, which is the gender imbalance and the significant surplus of males um, I can't help notice in that context the recent disturbances from demobilized or imminently demobilized servicemen, particularly the army, as a result of armed forces modernization. That could be an awful lot of angry, fit young men. Thank you. <laughs> Austin mentioned the pliant population, and I think that's the wrong word. My experience is that, and actually it's more problematic, is a disengaged population. Um, people who, when there's a problem on the metro system, will say, well, it's not my job to tell you where to go or how to get out, because my job is to do something else. Um, and that, I think that's the, what Kerry alludes to when he talks about the elite there are concerned about the changes in people's hearts. The way I have it described to me, when I teach at um, the Pudong Party School, in fact, is that there's a crisis of values in China. Um, and the elite are particularly worried about young people. They really have no idea where they're obtaining their values from. Uh, and they're extremely concerned about that, as we know from the whole social governance agenda that came in through the uh, previous uh, kind of party congress. Um, but so in relation to that, my question was actually addressed to Ying Ying Tian, which is, um, you said, um, you made mention of a couplet, you said strong leadership and shared vision. But there's no necessary movement from strong leadership to shared vision other than through engagement. Um, I, obviously the authorities in China are alert to a crisis of engagement, but in, in what sense do you see them ever breaking through in terms of actually engaging people in such a way that their vision becomes a shared vision? Different question this, but how livable would the Chinese perceive cities as being? Would they want to move there because they get a good standard of life, or would they have to move there under duress because you need a job, or because the government would basically say that that's where you go? Yeah, there there is a crisis of values in the Chinese um, young peoples, young generations, because um, 
you know, uh, uh, I, I, I did um, a research for Chinese developers for uh, what, what meaning of happiness to the Chinese people at the moment. And the first is uh, the purposes. The, the purposes could be, you know, you, uh, attached to the community, it, the purposes could be, you know, every day you have um, an activities that you love to have. It could be job, it could be the charity work, it could be looking after family, you know, e everything. So um, this is something that the China um, would like to build up to understanding the purpose and the meanings of everyday life. It's not just a uh, money or economically, you know, to be uh, economic freedom, but other things in terms of connecting with other people, the social life or the community lives. And then the um, the, the recent uh, working with uh, the Chinese large developers is they would like to understand, uh, because that, that uh, large developer has a very strong aim to build a very healthy and a sustainable community and, or towns that will um, that will sustain um, uh, in in the in the long term, and then he would like to actually engage the government and the communities. He would like to understand. Uh, what kind of community groups could it be in the in the town and how to organize it? So what we um, because I'm also a master planner and urban designer and we did a lot of project with them is just uh, to engage people from the beginning to understand their thoughts and try to um, um, like a project, we involve them that has universities, we involve the university groups to come and then let the student to think about what to say about what they would like um, to have in the town. Maybe some of the starters or spinning off offices um, in the town that will bring all these kind of um, engagement at the beginning of building the town. And then the another thing is uh, what I mentioned as a stewardship, because, because um, they are starting to understand, you know, the long-term stewardship is different with the development. The development is a commercial-like behavior, but the long-term management could be more like a, a non-profit, but, uh, you know, for the benefit of the community. So. This is the thing they try to understand what kind of things the community should do and what the kind of thing uh, the, the government should do and, and then uh, could in, uh, have a better way to engage uh, people. So um, I'm not sure whether I answered that question. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, um, <clears throat> on, on gender imbalance, or I, I don't think <laughs> the amount of people being let off by the People's Liberation Army is, is very, I mean, what is it, half a million? I mean, that's not going to have a huge impact. Uh, I mean, that's a tiny, tiny proportion. Um, the bear, they're called bear branches, aren't they? The bear branch, you know, the, the bear, bear branch men, I think they're called, this rather disarming term about unmarried men. Um, there's about 50 million, I think, projected. Um, and I think in rural Guangdong, uh, someone said there was 150 men to 100 women which is about my memory of an average Cambridge nightclub in the 1980s. So I, I think we, we, we found a way through that. We found a way through that. Um, but it is, it is a huge demographic imbalance. It's very strange. China's population sort of, as, as Austin knows, population kind of profile is very strange because of various distortions. The one child policy, well, it wasn't a policy. It was an instruction issued in 19, September 1980. And it was very patchily sort of implemented. There were all sorts of kind of different, um, you know, kind of opt-outs. And so it's, it, and actually the population was falling in the Maoist period in about 1970. Uh, that was the peak. And then it really started to fall because of this policy in 1973 about fewer, le you know, having um, fewer children later. So there's lots of controversy over whether that, poly you know, that, that kind of initiative, if you want to call it that, really had any value or any, any real impact at all. Um, certainly not as many as the 400 million children that it says that China doesn't have. I mean, that, that's a very strange, um, you know, kind of thing. Um, how do they regard cities, people moving to cities? It's very variable. So one of my PhD students is doing, you know, kind of uh, people moving to Tianjin near Beijing. And so some people are incentivized, some people don't like it at all. Some people, you know, kind of go there to be with family. It's very, very variable. I mean, you can't really make very, very big um, generalizations. But on the whole, it does mean that people are going from places where they have land rights or where they have kind of a community around them to places where they have nothing. And so it is, uh, you know, that issue of how do you create cohesion? Um, and finally, on values, um, uh, 
So the Communist Party of China has always had a really kind of weird ethical system. And if you look at over the sort of decades, it was a sort of brand of utilitarianism, maybe. And then uh, Xi Jinping has tried to link it with traditional Chinese kind of cultures from Confucianism and Mengzi and Shunzi and people like that from the uh, Warring States period 2,500 years ago. But I mean, um, it's a very hybrid kind of system, uh, and it is slightly strange that the Communist Party, which came to power in order to topple these sort of traditional uh, value systems, is now kind of really using them. And actually in Suzhou, I think there's the place you work, there's the sort of reading lake, isn't there? The kind of the reading area, which has this massive, these abhorrent sort of um, you know, statues of Confucius, which are the most disgusting things, aren't they? I mean, of these sort of huge kind of, you know, kind of uh, uh, dramatized things. Uh, but, but I mean, it's strange that the party is trying to embrace the very thing that it came to power to destroy. It's very, very, uh, you know, contradictory. I second all of that. The thing about China is that, as, as I see it, is that actually it's kind of 30 years behind the West in many things, like advertising, TV, horrible 1960s TV you get in China, um, and it's catching up. But it's, it's now, in some ways, in terms of urban design, very much at the Charlie Ledbetter living on thin air stage of Western development. You know, the, the deindustrialization within Britain in the 1980s, 90s, uh, gave rise to lots of uh, areas being given a new community focus, a new museum, a new, you know, something to kind of cohere around. <clears throat> and it's, I mean, it's a sad indictment when China is obviously just learning everything they, they are uh, bringing in advisors. Uh, lots of them for, are from Demos, if anybody's old enough to remember these people. Uh, they're over there, ex-British ex Maoists going over giving advice. Um, and it's, it, that's how tragic it is. Um, but the thing is, is that there's, there is no civil society, I would argue, in China. Mm -hmm. Not as we have it in the West, definitely, but I would even argue there is no civil society. There is no independent central middle class. You know, I'm an architect with the RIBA, this kind of guild that was founded, you know, whatever it was, 300 years ago. In, in China, you don't have these things because they automatically present an affront to the authority and the, and the leadership of the party. So they're not allowed. So you have these kind of ideas of trying to create values, because there aren't any, uh, any belief in anything, because there isn't any. Um, and they do that through some of the things they're absorbing from the West. And as it happens, one of them is environmentalism. It's one of the biggest things you can do in China because China is a polluted monstrosity in many places, okay? Due to rapid industrialization under Mao, more so than under uh, what happens uh, after opening up. So you have these terrible polluted areas. If you are then gonna reinvigorate a sense of community, how better to do it than to try to have local people reporting polluting industrialists or polluting factories or people who are not doing what they should be doing. So there's this kind of strange new Maoism, not using kind of red bandanas, but actually using green bandanas, the idea that you will now become the environmental party. So people are uh, kind of reinvigorated in a sense of community activism through, in, through the environment, which I think is kind of really tragic. And it goes to, the, it, it, it speaks to the comment that was the first question, which is the anti-democratic nature of China getting things done. Now, I'm a big defender of democracy at all costs, uh, and I don't want to be a planner who says, we can't get HS2 built, we can't get Heathrow built, but look at China. They build 11 airports this year, right? How wonderful that would be, right? Yes, it would be, but actually, I still think that there's something lost in that mandated authoritarian dictatorial demand that things will get done over and above a certain amount of community, local, civil, uh, democratic uh, engagement. So it's, we have to be careful what we trade off. Following on a bit from that, what are the criteria for these eco-cities? Because um, it's easy for London to be an eco-city because it doesn't do or make anything. Um, um, and all they have to do is ban cars from the city centre. But, um, or introduce the, the taxation system. But in China, they're doing things, they're making things. And the coal and steel production there, some of it is really quite antiquated and old fashioned. Some of it isn't, I recognize that, but some of it is, and it's very polluting. So if you're building a city with steel, how does it um, count as 
eco, um, and also what are the rest of the criteria, because that's, I don't understand that. And also with the st statistics, we recognise their um, bullshit, but there's an element of truth in them. Does the state, the Chinese state, use those statistics as if they were real? Or is there like another set of statistics based on reality that they build their planning on? Or are they planning on, this, on, this, on these myths? Yeah, I don't think actually uh, I can agree on all uh, the comments. But uh, start from the, uh, the criteria for uh, eco-cities. Uh, I think, first of all, actually, Eco City is a place, like I mentioned earlier, for people to live and work and play. So it's focused on people and also shouldn't have any impact, negative impact onto the environment. Uh, at the same time, think about the local uh, historical context and how people, their lifestyle should relate to the, the format of the, the city. Um, actually, I admit, actually, in the last 30 years, Chinese urbanization was very much focused on large cities and also very much focused on the economic development of the cities. And nowadays, the Chinese authorities, they realize actually it's a problem. So they are much willing to take an integrated approach, especially um, they are thinking about how to, apart from building physical infrastructures, they are more and more thinking about how to really integrate social soft infrastructures into the same place, about education, healthcare, and everything else, and also how to co have a coherent environment with the natural environment. So I think everything is being considered well, well, as much um, uh, criticism in China uh, at the same time. Um, and also, actually, China is now thinking very much on really change the industrial uh, kind of development types. So actually, all these very heavily polluted industries are being really changed or upgraded with the new technology. Because actually, uh, China, as I think in Austin's uh, book, he mentioned a lot of huge investment onto the new technology and also on renewable energy to think about how we can make the city more uh, green and more uh, low carbon. Uh, one of the projects we are leading on is uh, a green and low carbon development of small towns. It's a joint uh, funded project by the UK's <coughs> foreign office and the Chinese Ministry of Housing and Urban Rural Development. Um, on that project, actually, we developed a technical menu, which we showed, apart from thinking only <coughs> the technical element, because people think about eco cities, they are very technical focused. Rather than that, we very much talk about how we can create a roadmap of starting from how we understand what people want and what are the key elements in our uh, city, what are the unique setting points, how we can make it better, and how we can draw a character of a town or a city, and then how we can engage with local community and design something people can live and work uh, enjoyly, at the same time have a very lower impact or negative, at least a neutral impact of the natural environment. At the same time, and we can have a mechanism to really monitor the whole process. I don't think the Chinese statistics are all fake. Uh, maybe not 100% <laughs> accurate. Maybe there is a margin, a bigger margin. But I think the majority is, is relatively uh, accurate. And uh, for our planning, we have this uh, annual book, which have a very I think it's relatively accurate uh, statistics about people's income and what's the population, what their job sectors are, and what's the new built areas and the focus. Based on that, actually, we understand. And we can understand the tendency, how the city was developed. And then we can understand, actually, what we want to achieve in the future. And also, China have this uh, five-year plan. It's quite a, a socialism type of thing. But actually, I think it's quite helpful to have a strategic approach about your city, what you want to ach achieve in five years' time, and what you have done in the past, and how you, you want to make it better. So I think the, all this mechanism uh, would help. And so, but as I said earlier, it's still a process. It's not perfect, but um, I think it's recognizing it needs to be get better. Okay, so there's a lazy strand in British journalism that often suggests uh, that Chinese interest in the environment and eco-cities is all about PR and marketing and flim-flam, and yet the panel, maybe there's a consensus emerging that they really believe in this and that you know, influences the policy and the kind of structures people live in, and it's not all about coal and uh, heavy industry and so on, but yeah. I did read a book some time ago which I thought gave a really lovely image of 
the difference between the American move west and possibly the China move west. And it was around the idea that every new city or every new town that was developed, there would always be a school, a church, and a newspaper. And I thought that was just quite interesting because I think it then talks about that thing about civics, civil society. Um, and obviously then on an architectural level, certainly within the UK, you have lots of buildings that are um, very much part of the fabric around schools and churches and newspapers. And I think it's quite interesting that certainly in, in Britain, you have a decline of those buildings now where things like libraries become cafes or um, the town halls get emptied out, like I'm in Nottingham and we've moved to a finance building and I work for a city council. So it's just really odd now that you have this odd reflection where the idea of moving west in America had civil, civil society very much at the centre. In Britain now you have a thing where some of those strong institutions seem to be moving into the background in their importance. And I was just wondering where you think China fits in um, or is it just impossible because of the point that Austin makes that you can't really have those strong institutions in an architectural form because they are a challenge to authority? I mean, obviously the church building thing isn't really applicable uh, in the same way in China as it is in America. But I wasn't saying that. I mean, if you're building a new city, the first thing you build is a university. And that gets the young people in with spending power. Uh, and you get, you know, many thousands of them. And then you can have small businesses, especially from local people, who can thrive on that. Then the state imposes in some ways or suggests that state-owned enterprises may move in to give a little bit of industry, you know, uh, attraction. And, and from that, then, it starts to spark and developers will invest. So it's kind of a, it's a kickstart investment by the state. In many ways, it's a very sensible agenda. So uh, you, you do have, you know, institutions. And from that, you can then start building cultural institutions. And, you know, actually, in Ordos, I think the first building that was built was Mad's, uh, Mad Architects in Beijing, their Ordos Museum. That was built before even the roads were built, uh, you know, as a... As a Foundation, but that was mainly for the architectural market to try and put Ordos on the map. Yeah, so there's lots of kind of cynical agendas being played out here as well as just simple planning logistical ones. But I don't want to, you to think that you know that China doesn't have any cultural buildings and it, it doesn't work in the same way because they are they, they are very clearly learning directly from Western advisors who they're calling in to tell them how to do it. They're copying it. So up until now, they've kind of taken the boulevards of Paris and they've taken the cycle lanes of Amsterdam and they've taken the parks of London and you know they've made this amalgam of, of, of a city which should work, but obviously doesn't because it's it's, art, it's artifice and it doesn't have a civil civic life to it. Yes. So they're now refining that agenda and making them nicer places. But the, but the lack of public activity and civil space still will blight China because. That's a social problem. That wasn't one sentence. Unless you're using Chinese statistics, of course. Yeah. My understanding, because you showed a map where most of the cities cluster in the east, and I was wondering, I understand that the Chinese state has tried to move more Han Chinese people into the e uh, the west, sorry, into Nepal to try and really colonise it, essentially. Um, is there no plan to kind of use this eco-city agenda to really build up those populations in the west? Of all the statistics in the opening presentation, I, I thought the most astonishing was the drop in uh, urban numbers in the 1960s, was it? A uh, real reminder of the level of control that the Chinese state has obviously exerted over uh, who can live in cities. And I think I read recently uh, somewhere that the pass system had been slightly relaxed. And I wondered to what extent uh, that was a recognition on the part of the state that they needed to evolve the way that they deal with uh, the flows of movement and, and uh, create cities. So on, on one level, does it, is it a recognition that they need to free things up slightly or just another way of uh, retaining control? And then on the other side of things, from the urban populations that are living there, um, I, I know you say there's no sense of civil society, but is in, I remember being there a few years ago and, and 
there did seem to be some level of, of uh, to some extent, uh, people within cities were finding ways of exerting their presence within the cities. And I, I just wonder, is, is there any movement in that direction towards the emergence of a civil society, albeit that you're, you're, you know, you're quite pessimistic about it? So the household registration system that you referred to was set up as an internal passport system, I think, in the 1950s. And uh, so it still exists. I mean, I think on your ID, you, you've got an internal ID, and it says it's your birthplace, I think, or your, your, your um, is it your maternal birthplace? The, anyway, this is where you're registered, and there's two types. There's a rural and a city one. And um, so this, despite the fact that there's a huge number of migrant laborers, about 230 million who don't live in rural areas, they live in sort of city areas, um, they still have... Uh, they still have, um, you know, rural registration documents. At the last People's Congress uh, about a year ago, that was reformed. Um, the problem is basically a fiscal one that, um, as a local government, you don't want people living in your city that you have kind of social welfare responsibilities to. And, the, you know, if, if you have someone with a rural uh, household registration document, you, they don't, they're not able to go to the schools, um, and there's certain social welfare that they can't have. Um, and the problem is that if the government uh, essentially says local cities have to supply these things, then they're going to need more money. And that means that they're going to need to tax these people. And the tax system in China is still highly imperfect. I think about 10% of taxation comes from private individuals. Uh, and in our system, that's 60%. So if you want to say what is the greatest current political problem in China, it is that you have higher wage earning, um, urban, servi uh, ur urban service sector consuming middle-class people, but they're not taxpayers. So if you want to make them taxpayers, you have to look at undertaking political reforms. So the household registration system, although it's been reformed partially, is still highly, highly imperfect. Um, and I don't think that that's going to be an easy thing under the current system to do, although uh, it seems to be the fundamental political sort of vision of this government, although under Xi Jinping, is to create as many people in the middle class as possible, and at some point, Maybe the plenum later this month uh, in Beijing, they're going to have to hit this issue of how do you do the, um, those kind of reforms in as politically sort of as a manageable way as possible. Uh, how do you get text out of people without giving them representation? That's never been done anywhere else, so good luck with that one. I think the, the household registration actually is in a, a process of reform, as uh, Keith mentioned. Uh, in Beijing, they started a pilot to really abolish that system already. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but can, can I just jump in and say you cannot, oh, it's not worth reforming the hukou system, it has to be abolished, mm -hmm. it has to be abolished. I mean, it's unfathomable uh, that you actually have people who travel to a city to work and then they have to go back home if they want to get their children into school or get medical treatment. They are classified as second class citizens by definition. The fact now that Beijing is reforming the system of, you know, so they're allowing some migrant workers to allow their children to attend schools, you know, very nice, but it's still a, 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 an authoritarian system. And Beijing is introducing, as you were saying, the population development, Beijing is just introducing a cap of 25 million people living in Beijing and in Shanghai. Uh, and this is phenomenal. I mean, it's, it's pragmatic, so it's understandable. I get it, but it's not free movement of people, which is what I would want to defend. I just want to... Um so that uh, in, in the past uh, 30 years, maybe there is a focus of uh, physical development in Chinese cities, you know, with a high, high, high rise buildings, skyscrapers, and concerned about how city look like. But now it's, it's coming to a stage that people are more concerned about the softwares and um, what kind of um, uh, people's lives, the quality of lives behind it, and how these kind of socio-economic issues can support the cities. So coming to that uh, civic society question, that I would like to say that um, because of the uh, emerging um, rich middle classes, there is a demand for, you know, to recreate the value of the society and the people, you know, they establish quite lot of groups at the, at, at the moment. They are, the China is on a, a big learning curve about how to build these, uh, you know, social organizations, the social enterprises. A lot of, because this year I was, um, we, we received the, uh, the requirement from China that uh, the, the China is a, 
a community um, trust, community trust association would like to come to UK to study because they obviously UK's community trust is, um, is more powerful because it you know it has various uh, forms and it, in China it's more like. Um, a small charity which is relied on the donation from the developers or individuals, but how the system could could run to support all these values to be established in China, I think this is a crucial, or this is a trending trend, trend, trend that China is going to. Wei Yang, you said making a city is a process, not a product. And um, when you look at the images of the eco-city, I mean, they do remind you a lot of the Prince of Wales' plans for Poundbury in Dorsetshire. You know, that he has an ideal vision of what he wants the world to be, and it's a completely static, contained thing that's all going to be rolled out in one moment. I wonder to what extent among that rich uh, middle class that you're talking about, presumably many of them have visited New York, to what extent there isn't a yearning for a sort of metropolitan... Uh, New York model, where you have very basic rules, not planning, and those basic rules provide a framework for a genuine urban freedom and autonomy, as opposed to planning, which seems to be a very static thing. Is there a possibility that people might start using New York as the model for the Chinese city? Yeah, I have a question about the whole idea of these eco-towns, both in the British and the Chinese uh, context, because I'd be particularly interested to know from the panel to what extent you think these ideas have a popular purchase with ordinary Chinese people, um, and to what extent also they have a popular purchase with British people, because um, without wishing to seem simplistic, it appears to me that um, in British society... Uh, we have uh, town planners and politicians who have g given up on fast development and instead embrace sustainable development and said, we're not going to build lots of roads and lots of houses uh, that you want. You made the very good example at the beginning about the lack of uh, new towns since Milton Keynes uh, in the UK. And then in China, we have an elite uh, which has basically given up on its ideology of Marxism and instead has adopted environmentalism. And of course that has real material impacts as you've described about uh, the new towns that are being created. Um, but having talked to a lot of environmentalists, those things would not pass environmental criteria. Environmentalists believe, for example, you should not use concrete because it's not sustainable. Now I don't uh, ag agree with that, um, but to what extent is this something that is very much reflective of the elites kind of giving up on their previous uh, systems of ideas. Uh, to what extent do those things appeal to maybe a new middle class uh, in China as they appeal to the middle class uh, in the UK? And to what extent do those things have popularity with ordinary people? Um, and as you said, there's still a lot of poverty in China and uh, a lot of people want to consume more in, in China. Is that compatible with the new environmentalism? I'm going to give each of our speakers a chance to respond, sum up, and debate, and so on. So. Uh, very interesting you mentioned New York, because actually I think there are so many cities in China try to copy New York. But the problem is only one New York can be exist in the world. Like we have only one Paris, one London in the world. The, the, the place being unique is because actually they are exist. Uh, how to say that? They exist because how where they are and which country they are and because of their history and the context. So China has to use its own uh, methodology to develop something really specifically for China. But of course, there are lots of good lessons uh, can be learned worldwide. And actually, I think the biggest problem in China is um, all the cities they have designed themselves too big. If you calculate all the cities' population. Uh, assumed by these city mass plans, you will see actually that city, the Chinese population has been doubled, which is the biggest problem. That's why we have these ghost towns and all these cities uh, built based on assumption we would have all these people come to live here. But actually, this gentleman asked a very good question about uh, wh whether the eco towns or eco cities would be popular, because all these cities need to be located in the right location where it can have good strategic public transport service to serve and also have enough good job opportunities for local people to work. And also, it shouldn't be uh, in a place to really 
have negative impact to the natural environment. In China, some eco cities actually select some of the most beautiful places. They say, oh, let's build an eco city where we should be. Let's be in a beautiful place, which actually damage more environment than it should be. Uh, and so the location it should be uh, considered first, but because sometimes the political controls, the location just uh, kind of come from the leader's mind, say, let's go there because I like it. So I think all this, we should give planners or, or professionals more um, credibility for them to make the right decision. And the environmental impact assessment actually should be considered as an integrated approach, part of the planning process to make sure all the proper environmental issues are considered uh, properly. Thanks. Kerry? Yeah, I, I, I mean, look, um, after 25 years of, of sort of living in China or dealing with China, I mean, if there's one sentence I think that has always helped me sort of work out uh, what's, you know, how to understand, you know, this, this, this amazing and wonderful place. Um, and it, it kind of, you know, is about the sort of the, the, the physical manifestations and, uh, uh, that, that Austin sort of talked very, very well about um, and, and kind of sort of talks to the questions of, well, you know, what ways this give people more spaces? What does it sort of give people this middle class more kind of, you know, options? How does it sort of create a kind of, you know, in sort of very, very hybrid Chinese modernity? Um, so that sentence actually that I always used to try and understand China is not uh, from classical Chinese literature or contemporary Chinese literature. It's actually from Machiavelli. And it is, um, to trust is good, but to control is better. <laughs> That's interesting to talk about uh, the eco town, eco city again, because um, Austin and I went to uh, Suzhou eco town in the summertime um, that we we designed five years ago, and the we found a lot of elements there, like uh, the the tram system is already um, built to the edge of the town, and there is a big wetland, and people seem but the not very development are going on with the eco town because uh, there's a lack of uh, a good mechanism for the land assembly and also development and make all the local villagers happy to move away from their home and then rebuild the town. So it's a, it's a slow process, but I think maybe it's it's a right pause because it's, it's a good moment of, to to, for people to think about what is really eco town, is it to like um, demolish a lot of villages and and then you know put in the high technologies and all these kind of um, uh, new buildings which is which is energy saving or is to work with uh, the local villagers and then build a, a better town. I think um, it, it, it's a quite an interesting moment that uh, um, it people start to think about that. And I think um, it's, it's, um, um, it's, it's not in, in a Chinese traditional philosophy. Um, the eco means ecological and also means um, living in harmony with nature. But in a Western context, it's more about zero carbon and all these, uh, the stick, uh, all these uh, kind of indicators that has to achieving uh, zero carbon. So there is a different meanings in, in the chi chi Chinese context. And I think this is um, the moment that people are exploring what is best for the city and what is the real meaning for the happiness and the well-being uh, of, the, of the lifestyle of, of the living in, in a place. That's my comment. Thank you. I think that, that last point is very important for the, the question on concrete development in China because it, it, it's a different language on many levels. I mean, it's a different language, full stop. Uh, but also, it, can they mean something different to what we mean? So a recent uh, survey on of, of architectural students, but what is the most sustainable material? British people said timber, Chinese people said concrete. And what's the least sustainable? The other way around. And it's partly because, I mean, the harmony of nature thing, but it's also the destruction of the forests and the woodlands of China over the, you know, the, the, the Great Leap Forward. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a sense that actually this needs, needs preserving because it's actually leading to desertification. There's real problems in China. So, you know, so you have hundreds and hundreds of sustainability consultants going to China telling them not to build in concrete. And they're getting laughed out of court. 
uh, and, and, and justifiably so. So I think that you know, we have to learn a new language and, and we have to appreciate that actually our, our dominance in the sustainability argument, mercifully, is now coming to an end. Um, the other thing is that in terms of uh, Chinese development, the, uh, it's not going to follow an American model. They'll copy America, they'll try to implement certain aspects of, of New York maybe, but it's never going to be New York. Uh, not because there's only one, but because this is China. Uh, and it just will not work, partly because of the social conditions and political situation which will not allow it. So what's happening instead is Shanghai has a 20-year master plan from 2000 to 2020, which is called the 1966 model, which is one center, nine cities, 60 towns, 600 villages. And that's what they're going to build by 2020. And that's, a, I mean, it's fascinating. So that's how they can retain the population density quite low within Shanghai, because they're building new cities which we don't even think about over here in the West. But actually, when you then look at some of the cities, uh, they are Thames Town, they are Italy Town, they're German Town, they're shit, Disney-fied kind of parodies of taken <laughs> from around the world. Scandinavian Town, I mean, what a joke <laughs> is that, right? These are horrible, horrible places that don't work because they're plastic versions of the West. So once China actually becomes to be a little bit more liberated and confident in their ability to actually design something for themselves, then maybe things will move forward. But that's a way off. Okay. <laughs> Thank our speakers. Thank you.